Join Justin Townsend and the Harvesting Nature crew as they explore the world of cooking wild fish and game while sharing recipes, tips, tricks, and lessons learned from their pursuit of wild food. We sure hope you ate before the show, because you're going to leave hungry. This is the Wild Fish and Game Podcast. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Wild Fish and Game Podcast. Uh, I got your host here, Justin Townsend, and uh, today I'm joined by none other than my brother from another mother, the inhabitant of the Great White North himself, Adam. How's it going, guys? Today, actually, I'm not going to get into what we're talking about today first, I'm going to get into talk talk about uh what our last episode was so click back on our last episode if you haven't listened to it already it's with uh andrew from the ek jimmy foundation uh where we chat a bit about a very interesting theory and uh process for uh basically killing fish like after you've caught them freshwater fish saltwater fish doesn't matter you essentially use like a, a spike plunge it into its brain you then immediately cut its gills to bleed it out and then you use this um basically like piece of wire equivalent i would say uh and you put it down its spine to paralyze it and so that following the theory of ikejime uh produces like world-class michelin star quality fish and while a lot of their work is geared towards more the commercial side uh to help the commercial fishing industry sort of grow and create a superior product it's definitely 100 percent applicable to the uh the recreation fishing side as well and i think that's something that uh is cool uh as someone who looks to sort of expand my palate in the world of wild fishing game continuously i think that that's something uh i'm i'm gonna start looking into and maybe start practicing a little more as i get versed on uh fishing here on the east coast in the chesapeake and and some of the other deeper waters so yeah Pretty exciting. So not really much to update for me as far as that. I think current events, getting settled in my new area, uh, ready to get out and start fishing and foraging and scouting for hunting season, which seems like it's getting to be just around the corner. Uh, I don't know. Adam, what do you got going on in your neck of the woods? Well, the summer foraging is is on. So I've been uh, collecting tons of chanterelles. Um, the lobster mushrooms are just popping out. I just collected like four or five pounds of those yesterday. Uh, lamb's quarters is wild green. It's all over the place. Um, milkweed pods. So yeah, it's been a pretty good time for, um, for that. And then, um, fishing as well. I'm just trying to make my way through the freezer, uh, to get, start clearing stuff out for the fall hunting season again. And, uh, I'll take this opportunity to shamelessly plug something, a project I just did that's not really related to wild game, but I wrote a book or co-wrote a book called Hue and Me. That's just available now on Amazon. And uh, it's kind of like a travel log that I helped my my friend and neighbor write. Um, he is a great storyteller, but not a, a self-professed, not a great writer. So he, he asked me for his help and I uh, helped um, to write this book. And it's, it's out now. The book launches tonight. So yeah, I thought I'd take a moment to plug that a little bit. Uh, so it's pretty exciting pretty exciting stuff i think uh anyone who likes like a bill bryson kind of book or just a you know light light fun read i think it's uh right up your alley so hope you guys check that out um other than that i'm not doing too much <laughs> you got it here That's what it looks oh like. yeah, well, yeah. headed yeah. over to the amazons <laughs> totally worth it diving into it this weekend is my plan so it's a uh, it's i'm looking forward to the read I was going to say one thing you mentioned uh working through your way through the your game in your freezer so I traveled from Denver to Washington, as, as I've professed a couple times on the, the podcast as of late. I brought my freezer with me, with my oh. meat inside of it, frozen mm-hmm. the whole entire way. And I wanted to share this, and I'll, I'll probably like do a little write-up about it. Um, but I bought, uh, you know those like portable battery packs you charge up, and then you like plug oh, yeah, things yeah, into? Yeah. So yeah. Um, essentially, I got one that would hold a charge for like eight hours. And so what I would do is... It, it was in a rapid charge as well, so it charged in an hour. So I would charge it. I would have it running in the vehicle all day long, keeping things frozen. It literally would keep the freezer on its lowest setting, would stay at like one or two degrees Fahrenheit, so pretty pretty close to freezing. I think the highest I ever saw it got was 20 degrees, um, so still frozen completely. Um, 
but I would we'd drive, you know, four or five, six hours or whatever. We'd get to our hotel room. We'd check in. I'd take it in. I'd plug it in for an hour, let it fully charge. I'd take it back out, plug it back in uh, again, and let it sit overnight, and it would just keep the freezer running. And really, the freezer only wasn't running for maybe like an hour or two or three uh, kind of like while we did stuff, but the battery never completely ran out and like it stayed frozen the whole entire way, which is pretty cool. Cause we took, um, we took a week, no, nine, no, six days to get here. So that's awesome. Yeah. I'm pretty pumped. I was like, man, that's a yeah. cool, it's a, it's a neat trick, travel trick, especially if you're moving and you, you know, you want to take your, your meat with you. Uh, I still had a little bit of, not a little bit, probably like half a freezer left. Um, uh, that I'm going to start working through here pretty heavily, getting ready for, for hunting season. Got my kitchen all set up. Got like a, a workspace that's just uh, set up just to work on recipes and stuff and, and photograph and create. So uh, pretty pumped. Um, let's see. So today, now that I've rattled on, uh, today we're going to talk quite a bit about uh, grinding meat and ground meat. So similar to sort of the cooking by cut series that we're doing, this is kind of as we, right before we make the jump into offal and start talking about the individual cuts uh, from inside or those like very special lovely cuts like the head and the tongue and the the liver and heart uh we're gonna discuss a bit about uh ground meat and i think this is something that a lot of people use and maybe a lot of people don't know as much details we're about to talk so uh keep keep on listening there's some good stuff and at the end we'll cover some of our favorite like recipes we have for ground meat um our next episode uh we've got another guest on uh brad leone uh many of you i'm sure have heard him speak seen his youtube videos seen him on meteor or heard him on other podcasts um we're going to kind of be sticking with the fishing theme of the summer and talk about some of his fishing adventures and and cooking fish and uh i'm going to do a book giveaway of his uh his book uh field notes for food adventure i've got a couple copies here with me and so we'll uh we'll give away a copy of that uh very creatively so be sure to tune in that episode to figure out how to how to uh to win that um and then following that we'll do another cooking by cuts episode which we're gonna like i said dive into the awful we're gonna start off with the head and the tongue so those will be some very yummy uh actually probably two two of my my favorite is we talk about uh head i mean i don't know it's hard to pick a favorite when you dive into the world of (laughs) awful um i really like uh adam makes a pig camp this this uh uses the head and makes riettes which is probably like one of my favorite things in the whole entire world uh that he makes which says a lot because he makes a lot of really yummy food. <laughs> so that's pretty awesome. And then um, we are just going to kind of roll with it through that. So I guess, Adam, anything to add before we jump into it? No, I think I'm ready to go. All right, let's do it. Let's do it. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the history of ground meat. Uh, ground meat, as we think of it, uh, very frequently called mince in a lot of other parts of the world. Um, that's probably largely to do with the fact that not everybody ground it. Uh, they probably generally mince it up really finely with a knife beforehand. When we think about grinding the invention of meat grinders, relatively modern in history, probably in the 1800s and some point, maybe the 1700s. But when you think about the evolution of meat consumption and you think about uh, just particularly ground meat, uh, and I pulled a lot of this down. I'll give credit where credit's due. There's a cool History Channel article uh, about the history of ground meat and the history of the hamburger. So if you want to go there and peruse that, feel free. So um, they trace it back to ancient Rome and Mesopotamia. Uh, Around 10,000 years ago, uh, the domestication of cattle in Mesopotamia laid the groundwork for ground beef and sandwiches, and then the ancient Romans ate a minced meat dish with pine nuts, pepper, and wine flavorings. Uh, and then you think about the expansion of the Roman Empire and Roman soldiers going everywhere, and I'm sure popularized that cooking technique. I think also, too, makes sense in my head. This wasn't in the article that if you've got a bunch of soldiers traipsing all over the European continent and North Africa and Asia and everywhere, and you're trying to feed them all, instead of trying to make like individual cuts or whole things, you just chop up a bunch of meat and throw it together in some dishes and say, here you go. Uh, so very easy to think about that. And I think something, um, I think about that pine nuts recipe. So pine nuts, pepper, which I'm guessing is maybe black pepper. Um, 
versus like a bell pepper. I don't know. We'll have to research that. That might be a cool dish to play around with. But the meat, the pine nuts, the pepper, and the flavorings, like that's you're getting uh, – you're automatically getting uh, your protein from both your uh, the meat, the pine nuts. Very, you're getting some oils in there, some essential oils and things like that. You're also getting um, a bit of like very high calorie protein, uh, some pepper, whether it's ground pepper or vegetables. You're getting a mix there, and then the wine flavorings. That's your acid element. So, pretty uh, could be pretty interesting dish but if you see that probably pretty prevalent in roman culture and then as we think about the evolution we continue on to like the 1800s and um in germany hamburg germany was known as a exporter of high quality beef Uh, and so restaurants in the united states after the large immigration of germans into the united states started offering up a hamburg styled chopped steak so I don't think that was necessarily like a patty, but that would be like it's the easiest way to describe a chopped steak, Adam. Kind of like Salisbury steak, yeah. Or chicken fried steak, yeah. Rough meat loaf, kind of flat rough meat yeah. loaf. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so they, that that was offered up, and then as modern medicine prevailed and continued to uh, evolve, people were still consuming like raw meat that was chopped or ground. And as we know, like if you're thinking about a steak, right, a lot of the bacteria and the yucky stuff's on the outside of it, you know, just through the, the processing part and the bacteria is on the outside of the meat, but it doesn't necessarily penetrate it. And when you grind it, you're allowing that bacteria to kind of get all throughout the meat. That's why they recommend it to a certain cooking temperature uh, for internal cooking I think we've seen that in modern times has kind of faded away through the evolution of, of just cleaning up the, the processing part. But um, back then, people were getting sick, right? Not as much refrigeration. You're buying your meat likely out of a stall, and then you're taking it home to your maybe kind of clean cutting board, and you were chopping it ferociously with a knife until it was in immense uh, form. And then you were, um, you were then eating it raw or semi-cooked or whatever. Well, they realized this doctor, a uh, New York doctor named James H. Salisbury, sound familiar, uh, suggested that cooked beef patties might be just as healthy. And then uh, cooks and physicians quickly adopted what they called the uh, Salisbury steak and started recommending people cook their uh, hamburger steaks or Salisbury steaks as we know them. And then from there, uh, we see the, the the transformation and the movement of the hamburger patty, uh, which is now formed uh, from the plate to the bun uh, in the early 19th century, um, though no one can really nail down where exactly that happened at. Uh, there's a lot of like, oh, we did it here, we did it here type situations. But I think in reality, like it just grew in popularity. And then you see sort of like the fast food industry pick it up. You've got places like White Castle, McDonald's, all that kind of standardized the, the process and the way to quickly cook and serve uh hamburgers and ground meat uh, dishes out and then you think about like going down to uh to texas where you get you've got the chile uh being cooked um you know with beans or without beans depending on who you are (laughs) (laughs) um i'm trying to think of some other ground dishes you've got the introduction of italian american food where you see ground meat uh paired with pasta sauce and spaghetti um Let's see what else. We, one, what else we, one would also be the Chinese and the Asian influence, as well as Turkish, of the dumpling, mm-hmm. uh, where there's a whole huge world of dumplings stuffed with ground meat um, all over, kind of all over Asia, and then into Eastern Europe as well. Yeah. So that's another massive kind of ground meat. Thing. Well, too, and then you get hand pies and pasties and all those things that you yeah. know came over from from Europe and got popular yeah. within we- even the Caribbean and Central America and empanadas and all that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, which what did we have in uh, when we were driving across? Um, uh, oh my gosh, I was. Uh, it was the Runza. The Runza. Runza. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I was just in talking to somebody about that the other day. <laughs> so it runs as like, I don't know, the consistency is like a dinner roll almost. Yeah. It was like a dinner roll yeah. stuffed up with like chopped meat and cheese, almost like kind of a Philly cheesesteak consistency, but a little different and like onions. Uh, and then it was like rolled and kind of sealed off. So, but it was like a oblong shape almost. Somewhere between like a sausage roll and an empanada or yeah. something like that. Yeah. 
Uh, they were pretty tasty. They, yeah, I thought they were delicious. I was just telling somebody yeah. about that. If they go to Nebraska, they should have one of those. <laughs> um, another thing, too, we, we think about uh, ground meat. You can't have sausage without ground meat. Whether you're making sausage patties, sausage links, or you're making full-on, like, cased sausage, like, you can try, but it's going to be a little more challenging <laughs> to try to case that. So, a lot of stuff, um, you know, going on. And I would even say, let's talk about ground fish for a minute, right? Uh, mm-hmm. The mm-hmm. Ground fish balls, uh, very prevalent in a lot of Asian countries. Um, and then you've got fish sausages uh, in some various countries across... I would say Southeast Asia, um, um, Oceania, and then even in Hawaii, mm-hmm. I know they there's a lot of folks that will make uh, sausage out of ground fish. Yeah, salmon burgers. Yeah, salmon burgers. Popular. Ground yep. up. Yep. So really grinding itself uh, a very vital, important use. Um, but why? I guess uh, why do we grind? And I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Adam, for a bit if you wanna you wanna go on about why we grind meat. Sure. Well, for for all of the above, for your hamburgers and your dumplings, your sausages, like all that, it's not just uh, like what's left over. It's it's actually super tasty stuff. Um, so we we grind to get certain products that we love, like those. Um, sometimes it's nice just to have a bunch of bulk meat that's that you've ground up that's really easy to cook. Like I love having ground meat in the freezer just for. You know, simple dishes, easy dishes. It's just nice to have, you know, a lot, quite a bit of it. Um, I find as hunters who do their own butchering, you end up with a lot of trim. Um, and whereas, just say, if you're making like a really special burger, you might be grinding like a specific part to make those, like a specific recipe. But if you do a lot of butchering, you're going to end up with a ton of of off cuts or certain cuts you might not enjoy that much or cuts that you're not going to use or, or trim and all this stuff that you can just grind all up into ground meat. And then it's useful for a ton of different things. So, uh, that's the, the joy of ground meat. You can just, you know, use all the stuff that might've gone to waste, or I guess you could throw it into a stew or something, but, um, you make something that's kind of partially a waste product to make it super versatile and delicious. Um, I think that's often why we grind. Um, do you want to talk about what cuts? Yeah, sure. Um, so when we, we've we covered a lot in cuts, we've mentioned sort of cuts. There's definitely folks that, uh, you know, will grind the neck. Uh, hopefully we've dissuaded you from doing that. <laughs> the front shoulder as well, all the cuts off of that. Grind it if it makes you happy, I think is the, the story at the end of the day. If you want to grind a whole animal, grind the whole animal. Just know there's some other cuts and stuff in there that you could be doing stuff with. Um, when you get back and you really want to get to like some good uh, bulky cuts, uh, I would look towards like the back quarter of the animal. Um, your rounds are good. Um, even your sirloins, if you want to use those for grind meat, that's going to give you a lot of good bulk, um, for that. So I think those would probably be my top recommended ones. Yeah. I I think there's a general proclivity to, to grind the front shoulder. uh, And that comes from beef and pork, which have these front shoulders that have this like perfect fat to meat ratio. Uh, they're, they're quite tough. They're great for grinding. They have good flavor. Uh, but when you have wild game, you're not working with a ton of fat. So you, you're not worried about those fat to meat ratios anymore. And we'll talk about fat later on. But you're going to have to add fat. You're going to have a lean product anyways. So I always prefer to eat the shoulder like uh, braised or slow cooked. Mm-hmm. And I tend to like it more than the backside. So so for wild game, I don't think it's necessary to stick to certain um, traditional cuts for grinding because it's all going to be lean anyways. So you might as well just grind the parts that you're not likely to eat as much or you don't like as much. Uh, where if I was working with beef or pork, I'd be more inclined to grind the, the shoulders up. Yeah, so almost the reverse. If you're looking to yeah, grind, yeah. you can uh, grind from the, the rear quarter versus the front quarter of the animal because I think you're going to find more flavor in the front quarter of the animal on wild game, even to include the neck as well. Mm-hmm. So. Absolutely. Um, let's see. I, I think too, we, we mentioned it, right? Meatballs, sausages, hamburgers, uh, random cuts you may have that you don't know what are, uh, is you're kind of like <laughs> digging stuff out of the freezer. It's also too a really great way. Like if you're at the point in the season where you're like, I just need to like clear this stuff out, uh, you know, take it all, all these cuts out that you're kind of 
not excited about that have just lived at the bottom of the freezer, throw them through the grinder, you know, mix them with some fat and uh, make burgers out of them and have like a, you know, a summer barbecue or something. That's a good way to, to clear through that to make room for new stuff uh, for this coming year. Um, let's talk a little bit about, about equipment. Uh, I mentioned earlier sort of like the evolution of of mints to ground, um, and I don't know the exact point, the grinder be it a hand grinder first and then later on an electric grinder was invented but um i'm sure that at some point that changed and became popular probably through the industrialization of the the butchering and processing method that became pretty prevalent and then we've got the introduction of the smaller like um we'll say like home butcher grade grinder that most of us use today. And I think even that in the last 10 years has grown in popularity and variety. You know, I remember thinking back, uh, you've had just a couple of manufacturers that were major uh, suppliers. Uh, you know, you've got folks like Walton's, you've got uh, Lim or LEM. And then um, who's the other one I'm missing off the top of my head? Either way, there's there were several companies that kind of around. If you if you go back ten years or so and you look, if you were to take a snapshot in time, if you could, uh, you would find a, a few were very prevalent in the hunting and processing space. And then sort of over time, there's there's been other companies come in and introduce themselves on the market. So uh, very interesting. But how big of a grinder do you need? That's a common question we get, and I love Adam Steele's answer: is you probably need a bigger one than you think you do. Um, and mm -hmm. you can, yes, you can grind meat with a KitchenAid grinder, uh, attachment, uh, till your heart's content. No, it's going to probably take you several hours of meat grinding in order to get through a bunch of meat, but you can do it that way. If that suits your budget, um, if you want to invest in a grinder, um, you know, they are, can range anywhere from a hundred bucks on up to 500, $600, depending on what horsepower and what size you want. I think I have like a pretty medium price grinder, like probably a $200 grinder. Or so, um, it does really well. Same here. Yeah. It does well. Yeah. Uh, it's able to push through meat, not overheat, not reset. I can, you know, generally the way I kind of work through my grinding is I, I do the whole animal butchered out uh and then i take all my trim and all the stuff i'm going to do for a grind and i set it aside uh until the very end that's usually like my last cuts of meat that i work with um and then i will make sure everything's cut up into pieces that i can fit for the grind and then sort of freeze it um and that partial freeze is really important um, it's really important because if not, uh, that meat's going to get hot and it's going to have an inconsistent grind as it moves through the grinder. Um, and that's also very important for the fat as well, which we'll talk more about here in just a minute. You want a partial freeze on that also too, because it, it allows it, um, the easiest way to think about it is that if you, people go and they cool and they chill and they hang an animal, right? And then you're able to now easily take your knife and sort of like cut through that and make the cuts you want whether it's meat or fat or whatever um same exact process when it comes to the grinding portion of meat like the meat grinds better when it's super cold almost frozen or if your grinder can take you know semi-frozen to i would say three quarters of the way frozen meat then like you can grind it that way too it, it will produce some good quality grind um any other thoughts you have on that adam before i dive into this or feel free to dive into it yeah i just wanted to pull back for a second and talk about other forms of grinding briefly um because I, I think both of us just suggest getting a decent grinder like uh like we're talking about like a couple hundred bucks uh it will suit all your needs probably unless you're doing a couple elk or moose every year like um it's gonna do everything but a lot of people have asked me and i went through all this myself <clears throat> where i got my grandfather's old grinder hand grinder that you just like screw onto the table and grind and i'm like this is great it's a connection to my ancestry it's my grandfather's made count put countless pigs through this thing uh made sausage and i tried it out and i'm like holy shit that sucks like the, you're grinding it forever and the i found the, the blades weren't sharp enough and my arm was tired and it was a really slow process and then i got the KitchenAid one and quickly discovered that that wasn't enough for what i needed it for you can also use like a, a food processor where you just uh, blitz uh, like six or seven blitzes instead of running it full. You can do that as well. 
and you can hand mince, which is actually probably the best thing you could do for burgers and stuff is hand mince. You get it all different textures and everything. So the Chinese do it in a lot of different places, but uh, that also takes forever and you'll have blisters by the time you're done. Um, it's so for th- those romantics out there, like I started out romantic and then I quickly got disillusioned with all that. <laughs> I just went and bought a good grinder. I'm like, okay, enough of this nonsense. I'm just going to, you know, I was butchering several deer at a time and I was like, this is way too much. So um, I hope everyone, I can just make people skip that whole romantic headache and, and just jump into the, a good grinder because, yeah, I could have saved a lot of time and swearing and blisters if I hadn't. So, <laughs> Good plug, good plug. Yeah. Um, no, I, I, I agree too. Like I, I kind of started on a similar path, like using the KitchenAid grinder. I don't think I ever used a hand grinder because I just looked at them and like the only ones I've ever seen were like an antique shop and I'm like, this seems like yeah. it's going to be a lot of work. Yeah. Um, I guess maybe that's why our generation doesn't have big giant arms like uh, our grandfathers exactly, yeah. did. <laughs> We'd have to grind our own meat. Um, Weaklings. Yeah. Um, so I sort of already kind of jumped into the process of, of grinding meat uh, and sort of the method behind it. So it, it's fairly straightforward, right? You're going to cut the pieces in the size you need. You're going to partially freeze them, uh, as I mentioned. I think another important step that people will miss is the fact that you should be taking your grinder parts not the grinder body itself but like the neck the even the tray the blades the um i don't know we'll call it for lack of a better word the spinny thingy inside um (laughs) the plates the uh everything and putting it in the freezer as long as your meat is in there as well i would say minimum 30 minutes maximum for the metal you can be overnight it it doesn't matter the colder the better uh the meat i would say you can range it anywhere from you know 30 minutes, an hour on to like four hours or five hours, depends on how cold your meat, the meat gets. Um, so once you got all that out, you're going to leave the meat in there. You're going to pull the grinder parts out. You're going to quickly assemble them and then you're going to pull the meat out and you're going to start feeding it through there. Um, you want to make sure that you start with the large plate uh, first. Don't try to force a bunch of chunked meat, largely chunked meat through the fine, small grind plate. Um, you're not going to be happy with, uh, with the results. Um, it's going to be mush. Yeah. It's going to be super mushy. Um, Mm. start with a large plate, run a cycle through there. And then this is a part that's a little up for debate. Uh, some folks, depending on what you're making and just depending on like, if you're making a big batch of sausage, be it like you're going to make the mix for sausage casing or you're making sausage patties or whatever. I sometimes will season, um, season and add my fat at the point where all everything's in the large uh just because it mixes really well and then you're going to run it through the small again uh the small grind plate which is going to also kind of mix and bind everything together uh so i tend to do that if i'm just grinding meat for grinding meat and i'm not going to add fat to it i'll just take it take it thin uh clean out your plates clean out everything Put them back in the freezer for 30 minutes, put the meat back in the freezer for 30 minutes, and then grind through the small. So, like, if you're going to grind meat, don't cut corners. Like, do the full process uh, in the time. Take the time to do it properly. Um, yeah, and, it, it, and just a second, if, you, if you, you're watching the meat coming out of the plate, if you start to see fat kind of smearing on the plate, or you see kind of a bright pink fluffy kind of meat smear that means it's too hot you got to stop you got to throw everything in the freezer and give it a break and then do it again because uh that's just signs that that the friction from the from the the blade is causing the whole thing to heat up and it's starting to melt your fat and change your the texture of your meat that's time to take a break yeah so absolutely keep, keep keep watching that when you're grinding called smearing because uh, it'll it'll too it'll start to bind up on the inside of uh, inside of the um, like the feeding tube and everything and like it'll catch it's just not good it, it's not great at all um, so you have a note in here too about for waterfowl and poultry skip the first grind can you allude allude a bit about that yeah I'm not sure if it's just the the texture of it or it just goes through a lot easier but uh, you don't really need to grind poultry whether it's waterfowl, ducks, geese, chicken, grouse, whatever, you don't really need, or a rabbit, I'd imagine, too. You don't need to do it twice. You can just pass it through once. It doesn't have the same, 
like muscle fiber texture as pork and beef and whatever else deer and venison um and you're gonna affect the texture so you can just pass it through once and it'll be just fine uh if you're working with any big game animal you're definitely gonna want to do a double um like two passes and then you want to talk about hand mincing in more detail sure yeah so so like i said hand mincing you're gonna end up with a better if you're if you're thorough with it you're gonna end up with a better quality product at the end than passing it through like a, a any sort of electric grinder uh, and the reason for that is you end up with different textures within the same um clump of meat and that's actually really nice for eating so if you're say you're gonna make a burger or if, if you're making um like if you're making tartare they'll always say hand mints uh so what you do you take a you're gonna want like a big kind of wooden cutting board a lot of chinese chefs will use like a stump because the way you're using it, you're probably going to leave indents into your cutting board do not use a uh, plastic table <laughs> no do not do that you're gonna have chunks of the plastic table mi- missing uh i find a cleaver cleaver or a pair of cleavers works best but you can also use just a really sharp heavier knife and you're just gonna chop the hell of it over and over you're gonna like scrape it up plop it back down twist it at 180 degrees and, and keep chopping and chopping and chopping until your consistency is right. Uh, you're going to want to keep it cold. It will cut a lot better if it's partially frozen as well. And uh, it takes a long time, but it w- does create a really nice product. So I would say if you're going to do, you know, like uh, a burger for you and your partner or a really special night of something, I would say hand mince, but otherwise I'd just say send it to the grinder. If you're going to sit and hand mince an entire deer, you're going to be there for half a month, I think, so... Yeah. Oof. So, yeah. It'd be a lot. It'd be a lot. Um, so, I think that that will get you through the whole process. So, let's talk a little bit about a very important thing. Um, well, also, too, we didn't mention it in here, but I'll mention salt. Salt plays an important role. Uh, it's good to add salt in, especially if you're making sausages, because it helps with the binding of the meat. Um, we could probably spend a whole episode talking about the binding and the use of salt. Uh, we did a whole episode with it. If you go to our YouTube channel, um, there's a, a portion there where we talk about grinding meat, and I talk a lot about salt and the salt ratio to use and why it's important. Um, but it's a video in there we did for the Sporting Chef show. Um, it's it's pretty in depth and thorough, so I won't spend too much time on it here. But I want to talk about fat ratios. And I want to talk about fat ratios because a lot of people talk about fat ratios for wild game, especially <laughs> you've got your purist out there. Uh, I've seen them, the keyboard warriors on the Facebook forums that are like, why would I ever add beef or pork fat to my meat? That takes away from the wild game. You know, at the end of the day, it's like what we say. It's a, it's a personal preference, right? If you want to add fat, yeah. add fat. If you don't, we're going to tell you some ways in which you can bind the meat, ground meat together without the use of fat. But guess what? You're going to want to bind something to wild game meat because it's so lean. It won't just naturally stick together. Um, I think it can dry out very easily too. Yeah. Super. Yeah. And, and, uh, yeah. fat, fat is, is a forgiving ingredient for overcooking. Um, so, Adam, you want to hit kind of on the fat ratios real quick? Sure. So generally when you when you see like a fat ratio, you're going to see a number and then a slash and another number. So say 70 slash 30, 90 slash 10. The first number represents the protein, so what meat you're grinding, and the second number represents the fat. And that's the ratio from meat to fat that's in your in your grind. Uh, and a different ratios will produce different products. Um so often, and a lot of this comes down to your own personal preference. Some people like a really fatty, juicy burger. Some people don't want any fat in their burger at all. Um, so it all comes down to what you like. But there are some pretty solid rules, including for sausage. Like, you cannot make sausage without fat. It is just not going to be good. <clears throat> and you're going to want at least a 70 to 30% meat to fat ratio for your sausage. And that is super important. Um, It's not going to emulsify. It's not going to bind. It's not going to be juicy if you don't do that. Uh, That same 70-30 blend, it's also great for burgers or meatloaf, different things like that. If you like a juicier, slightly fattier um, patty, Uh, then you can get into 80 to 20%. And that's kind of like your... So say if your 70 to 30 is your regular, if you're buying ground meat from the grocery store... 
20, 80 to 20 might be your um, lean. Uh, that's also great, just general. Like if I was just going to make a huge batch of ground uh, meat and I wanted to just put one ratio through, it would be 80 to 20. So that's going to be good for casseroles. It's going to be good for meatloaf. It's going to be good for meatballs, burger, whatever. Uh, if you like a leaner, you can bring it to 90 10. Then you'll like that's pretty lean for a burger for me, but some people like that. And uh, you can also do no fat at all. Uh, I hope you're not going to be making sausages with no fat. Burgers aren't going to be quite as good. Uh, but do you know where it plays really nicely is in like things like chili, casseroles, tacos. Uh, if you're just going to be frying the, the loose meat in a frying pan and adding it to something, you really don't need the extra fat. Um, so that's something to consider. If we're talking about burgers, the more fat you add, so if you're doing like a, a 60-40 burger, that burger is going to shrink a lot as that fat renders out. The less fat in it, the less shrinkage. So that's something to consider. And there's something else to consider as well as what your plan is when you actually are grinding or butchering your meat. How much like fat you want to add or like do you want to just make a huge batch of 80-20? Do you want to make different ratios and label them or do you want to grind your meat with no fat and then add ground fat afterwards when you're ready to cook those are all options and everyone does it differently what do you generally do justin um it really depends so like the 70 30 for the sausage is kind of what i typically go with um i actually will largely just use that for everything um, because I like to only mix it once. I, I don't feel the need to be that specialized. I tend to like even just your pan fried ground meat, uh, you know, a little more juicier, have a little more flavor. Um, so I'll just stick 70, 30 for everything. And, and then too, um, I don't always like do all of my sausage all at once. So I may, you know, I may make 10 pounds of sausage off of an animal and then I may make five pounds or, you know, eight pounds or whatever. Well, actually, let's do a larger number, maybe 15 pounds of ground, right? And I may mm-hmm. save five pounds for sausage and I may make the other 10 pounds into like individually one pack ground meat ball or ground meat packages. But that five pounds, I'll just vac seal in a bag and put back in the freezer. And then, you know, whatever day I feel like pulling it out and making sausage, I may make it out, uh, portion it out and then sort of like, uh, do it there. So I I typically won't. And sometimes I won't even mix the fat in until later. Um, so it really just depends as well. Kind of. Yeah. I do do this. I do the same, I think. Yeah. Um, I I don't mind having fat mixed in. A lot of people don't like the thought of mixing in fat from elsewhere. Uh, but it doesn't bug me much. I get my my pigs from my friend who grows them in the woods, <laughs> basically. So, like, there's no no worry on my end about oh, that. So that's that uh, North uh, Canadian super pig. That's where that's coming from. Yeah, huh? exactly. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, uh, no, I I too. I mean, I go way way into it with fat. Like, I'll use duck fat mm-hmm. for cooking a mm-hmm. burger in. Like, you know, whatever. Uh, it, yeah. You know, it's all it's all going to the same place at the end of the day. So. Yeah, and that brings up a good topic is what type of fat to use in your grind, because a lot of people have a lot of different opinions, strong opinions mm-hmm. on this too. Uh, so what I generally like to do is use a pork back back fat, which is a really neutral fat. If you're using a pork shoulder, which you can because it's got a good ratio of fat to meat, or a pork belly, you're getting more porkiness that's going to come through your, your grind, like say if you're mixing with venison, or elk, or moose, whatever. Uh, if you use pork back fat, it's way more neutral. So you're going to get that fat without getting the, uh, the porkiness in it. Uh, so I, that's generally what I like to do. And to find that, um, either butcher your own pigs like I do, or you can just go to the grocery store often and ask the butcher or to your favorite butcher shop and ask them for a bag of, of pork back fat. And they'll often just give it to you for free. Uh, I've had several times where they just gave it to me for free or for next to nothing. So that's a great resource to just go and get that. Another option is uh, beef fat, which doesn't have that porky flavor, but it has a big beefy flavor. Uh, some people like that. It will make your burgers taste more beefy, uh, but it does have a bit more of a waxiness to it. Mm-hmm. Another option is bacon, which a lot of people do. And sometimes I like bacon. 
I like it in my breakfast sausage, the odd burger or something, but generally I don't want my stuff to always taste like bacon. Yeah. Uh, and it, it will lend a nice bacony, smoky flavor, which is good, but I don't always want that. So I tend to use bacon in smaller batches for special things rather than just doing my whole thing in, in with bacon. Um, so it's all, and then sometimes, honestly, I let a little bit of venison fat stay in my burger as well, which is also something most people don't want to do, but I kind of like the flavor of venison fat. If you do a little bit, it's not going to be super waxy. And I like to have that, especially just for like smash burgers. So, um, usually when I'm butchering deer, I'll save a little bit and I'll put some venison fat through in some of the last meat and I'll just make some smash burgers for supper with just venison fat and and meat and uh i'll eat them super hot and they're the most delicious burgers i've ever had in my life but you got to eat them right away you got to eat them hot (laughs) or else it's going to just coat your mouth with wax so uh so that is another option but it's not a popular one you got to be very careful with with leaving um venison fat in in the mix but i'd like to leave you know like probably like a two to five percent in my mix as well nice so yeah. I mean, yeah. I don't, yeah, I don't go crazy. Even trimming, like I'll still leave like uh, some of the silver skin and tendons and stuff like that. Like I'm just kind of whatever, like it's going to go through the grind. Yeah. So like, it's not super particular. I'm sure there's a meat grinding purist that's going to like write me a nasty yeah. note about that, but I don't really care. Yeah. Um, when I'm on hour, hour 10 of butchering, yeah. I care less and less. Yeah, I'm like, I just want to, <laughs> yeah. I want to do this. I'm done. I'm done. Yeah. So, um, let's talk a little bit about some of the binders. So we mentioned other than fat. Um, there's definitely the opportunity to use other things. If you do want to stay in the lane of, of more pure game meat. I mean, if you want, you could try to piece together a burger, uh, that's solely game. Um, it's doable. You just got to be very careful with it. It's likely going to fall apart. I wouldn't put it all on the grill. I'd pan fry it if you're going to try it. Um, but one alternative, I've done this with a lot. Uh, I do it a lot with like meatballs and things too. Maybe I don't want as much fat. Maybe I just want some flavor in there. Um, you can, for every one pound of meat, uh, you want to use a quarter cup of breadcrumbs and a one egg whisk up. Um, I mean, you can whisk it, you can smash with your hands, you can do whatever makes you feel nice, but that's kind of the general ratio for binding. Um, there's also some recommendations and you can do this too, of like the equivalent amount of breadcrumbs. You can, you either put in like minced garlic, onion, uh, things like that to kind of help with the flavor. Um, but don't go too much cause then it'll get crumbly and fall apart. So if you stick to that ratio of like a quarter cup breadcrumbs, a quarter cup onion, garlic, whatever mix, parsley, whatever you want to put in there. And then uh, one egg, that will hold your bind together pretty well uh, per pound. Um, the other thing, I, you know, I, I've got on here tortilla, tortilla chips, tortilla. I have put tortilla through the grinder. I think it was an episode that Jesse Griffith did, I think, on Meat Eater or something like that, uh, where he was making sausages, I think, uh, from Neil Guy. And it was more of kind of like a Southwest-inspired sausage, and he was using uh, – He would pass tortilla through at the end to kind of clear it out, but then you get this like cool masa flavor, which you could also just use masa as well, Uh, egg and masa or just masa itself. Uh, We've got crackers on here, egg and crackers. That's pretty, pretty standard. Uh, I I mean, I guess standard. Uh, You can also use um, bread, like stale bread soaked in milk and then mix that in. Mm. That's very common for a lot of European dishes as well. Um, so that that would be great um and then um you can use oats oats themselves uh ground up um to put in there as well uh flour i mentioned and then you've got pork rinds in here yeah i yeah good for gluten gluten free yeah uh, i have some flavor i uh, i have some of those uh i think i used the last of them in i like to use them you know my favorite thing to use them on uh boudin balls so like, mm. bu- I guess it's another thing. Rice as well. Uh, boudin yeah, is rice. a sausage from like Cajun Creole origins, uh, very prevalent in Louisiana and uh, East Texas on the Gulf and stuff like that. So, but it's um, usually like it's a bit. 
it depends on how you make it. So I'll probably, like I said, there's going to be very passionate <laughs> people about this. So you can you cook large chunks of meat and kind of like cook them down till they fall apart and then grind them. You can grind meat and mix them together. You've got fat mixed in there. You've got rice. You've got herbs, all this stuff, and essentially cased in the sausage. Um, if you don't want it cased in a sausage, you can just use the mixture and make them into like balls and then you can pan fry them or you can make sure they're bound really well and you can put them in your crawfish boil water, which is also really good. Um, but I like to, instead of breadcrumbs for, uh, the, um, the outside coating of it, I like to use the pork rinds just cause I think it, it seems like mm. very natural. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. Something you mentioned briefly there, back to our grinding conversation earlier, is passing the tortillas through to push the last of the meat out, yes. which is something I meant to mention, is that when you're grinding, you're always going to have a bit of meat that doesn't come out at the end. And a good way to get that out is to put something in it, like bread or an onion or something that you don't mind being into your mix, and that will help push the last bit of meat out and... You can either dispose of the bready meat or you can just, I just leave it in my, in my grind because uh, it's such a small amount. So I usually put a couple of those or pieces of bread, sorry. You can do tor tortillas, um, an onion I've used, just anything that will push the last bit of meat out that you don't mind being in your meat a little bit. I also sometimes will just cir cycle a bit of meat through as well. Oh yeah, that will eventually yeah, push it. Eventually yeah. just kind of pushes it out. Yeah. So, and then you know like what the meat you pull out of the grinder is, has already been ground. So yeah. that's another thing yeah. too. Um, let's see. Do you want to talk a bit, uh, Adam, about cooking ground meat? So we'll move into sort of this like evolution to close things out. We'll hit on a couple recipes. Um, so we'll we'll move through sort of the cooking part pretty quickly. Okay. So um, first, we can talk about loose loose ground meat. Uh, so. One of the crimes of a lot of people committed loose ground meat is throwing the whole thing into the pan all at once before the pan's even really hot and then it all just like loses all its liquid and then it bubbles away forever and you get this gray kind of gross looking meat. Uh, don't do that. Stop doing that. Uh, get your hand, pan hot, add meat in small amounts, don't disturb it, like add a little bit of oil uh, or, or lard or whatever. Put it in, let it sizzle, don't disturb it until it gets nice and brown and gets a good crust, and then flip it and break it up. Um, stop getting this like gray, tasteless, gross, gross kind of meat. We want some mired reaction, we want it working hot, we want it in small batches so we don't overwhelm the heat and drop it uh, in the pan. So that's the case for pretty much any ground meat, just like like I said, let it let it sear, let it brown, break it apart, and get it nice and brown before you add anything else. Uh, you'll thank me later for that. Um, if we're talking making burgers, here's a couple couple hints. Uh, Justin mentioned salting is very important in the, uh, earlier, especially with sausage. But with burger, you want to salt as late as possible. Uh, salt will denature the proteins and make the burger patties very dense and tough. Uh, so if you salt way beforehand, that salt starts working into the ground meat and toughening it. So where we say salt steaks early, salt burger late. So I usually just will do, I won't do an interior salt. I'll mix my burger um, or my ground meat and then salt it pretty generously just before hitting the grill or the pan. When I'm shaping meat, it also leads to um, to toughness. So if you overwork your meat, if you got your hands in there and you're shaping, you're mixing, you're mixing, you're mixing, you're mixing, you're throwing a bunch of crap in there, and then you're mixing around, then you're like manhandling it all. You're adding a lot of heat, and you're adding, and you're pushing all those um, protein structures and tightening them, and that's going to be a denser, springier meat. Sometimes you want that, like a lot of Asian meatballs and stuff. That they really go for that. Um, but for a burger, I do as little as possible. I'm just barely putting things together. Uh, for a smash burger, you just make a meatball and then smashing it down on a hot grill or a hot um, surface, sorry. And for like a larger kind of traditional burger, I'm just gently folding into a patty and then seasoning it and throwing it on last minute like that. Uh, we'll often also put an indent in it, uh, the, pressing my thumb into the center of the burger patty, which helps... Uh, when it's cooking, the the proteins will will kind of tighten around it. Instead of like puffing up, it will just stay the same shape. And you said, Justin, there's a, you had a donut technique? Yeah, so I just make the patty and I just 
poke my finger all the way through the center of it. Okay. And then just like that also helps it, you know, cook a little faster too. Um, so as a technique my grandmother used to always do, and I've just always done it as an adult. Um, mm. Probably just sense. by same sheer kind of learning. Yeah, same concept as the <laughs> indentation, just like it cooks a little more uh, quickly. Yeah. So most of you cook ground, ground meat, you know generally how to do it, but those are some, some tricks. So for your meatballs, if you want nice, soft meatballs, handle them as little as possible. Wet your hands. It makes it a lot easier. If you want really springy, kind of tougher meatballs um, that stand up to like a sauce or more of an Asian style, then you're going to want to overwork it to build those proteins and tighten them up. Um, yeah, that's basically all, all there is to it. Oh, one thing I was going to say to you that you mentioned the mixing. To go back to the mixing of fat um, and even just mixing spices and stuff in there, you want the meat as cold as possible. Mm -hmm. um, that will help bind the fat to the meat and it would help bind it all together. So, like, so much cold that your hands hurt, like, when you're mixing it. Yeah. Like, that cold. If your hands aren't hurting, then it's not cold yeah, enough. Exactly. Basically. Yeah. Um, and you could also invest in those big mixers as well if you're really doing a lot of ground meat. I've got one. I use it every now and then uh, if I'm doing large batches of sausages for, like, people. Um, let's see. Let's talk about some recipes here. Do you want to – Adam, you want to lead off with yours? Sure. So – I have a meatball stroganoff with chanterelles up on my Intrepid Eater website. So this is basically like a classic um, stroganoff, except in, instead of using kind of like a cut steak, I used uh, meatballs. Uh, I made the meatballs out of venison. And for these, I mixed in uh, egg, breadcrumbs, um, some mushroom powder to go with the chanterelles. Uh, I wanted them firmer. So usually like in a, maybe in a pasta sauce, I'll go a little, little fluffier, but these one, I wanted firmer to stand up to the, the heartier sauce. So I uh, mixed well for about 30 seconds, which helps like um, kind of toughen them up. And then I brown them, like I said, hot pan, not all at once, get them nice and brown, add some onions, add the chanterelle mushrooms, some garlic, and then some stock, sour cream and mustard. Simmer that down until it's like gravy and just served over um, egg noodles in a classic way. And it's just a, uh, everyone knows and loves stroganoff. It's just like a delicious dish. Uh, and I just made it a little, a little different with the meatballs, which is actually really nice. I'm going to talk a little bit about, this is like a very decadent recipe. If you're thinking of wild game, the, the, the words decadent don't always come across your mind. <laughs> um, savory, yes enjoyable yes uh delicious yes but decadent not always so this is a uh blue cheese venison meatloaf atop horseradish mashed potatoes with a port pear reduction like so many flavors going on in this dish um but i promise you if you make this dish as intimidating as it sounds if you like blue cheese you will really really like this it's also if you don't like blue cheese you can sub it out the mashed potatoes and the port pear reduction are just like super phenomenal this came off like a podcast episode we did in like our very first season of the podcast we we talked with a, a couple of the guys from allen company um and we were just kind of chatting through recipes, uh, and a blue cheese meatloaf came up. And so I made the recipe for it, um, off of our conversation. And so really you're just making a standard meatloaf, uh, two pounds of ground meat, onion, eggs, breadcrumbs, garlic. I used herb de Provence, uh, as kind of like my herb base, uh, salt, ground black pepper, and of course a cup of blue cheese in there. Um, for the horseradish, mashed potatoes, pretty straightforward mashed potato recipe, um, uh, salt. I use white pepper in mine. That's an old restaurant trick I learned because it doesn't, you don't get those black flecks in there. And I think the white pepper makes a really interesting flavor. Uh, you can use horseradish and butter, like pretty straightforward. I, don't, I didn't even use any cream in there. You could use some heavy cream if you wanted to. Um, and then the port poached pears, uh, it's pretty easy. You're literally just bringing four cups of port to, to simmer in that, and you're going to take uh, pears that are peeled and halved, and you're going to let them just cook in that. Uh, the cool thing about it is the port won't go all the way into the pears, so when you 
cut them up into chunks, you'll get it port on the outside and just a little bit of pear uh, still coming through. And then I we use, I use chives to garnish it all. So super straightforward dish and like very, really tasty. Um, so I recommend it. 10 out of 10 would recommend. I was thinking about, I was like, ooh, maybe I should actually make this. I haven't made it in a while. Um, but really great use of ground meat, especially if you've got a big party or something and you want to, this is would be great for that, a big dinner party because uh, it's something flavorful. Meatloaf is something people are comfortable with, but it's like a little bit of a spin on a classic. Uh, actually, not a little bit. It's a lot of a spin on a classic. <laughs> um, and then, ooh, we've got Adam's famous green chili snow goose burgers. Let's hear it, buddy. Yeah. So these were the burgers I cooked up for the snow goose camp we had in uh, Missouri earlier this year. Uh, and it's I chose it because it's a great way to use something like like geese. So you're you're getting tons and tons of these snow geese. There's no real limits on them. Um, you might not want to save them all for for breasts or legs or whatever. Uh, try grinding it. It's great. Um, so I chose to grind these their breasts and legs. Pick thoroughly for steel shot. So recall, mm-hmm. remember, you don't want to pass that shot through your grinder. You don't want to pass it through your body or crack your teeth on it. So make sure you search it very well. Uh, for this one, I decided to go with bacon because I wanted that kind of the bacon smoky flavor to come through. Uh, so that's something, like I said earlier, you choose when to, when to do it. And I definitely want it for this. Uh, I also ground, so I ground the goose breast together with the, the bacon in a large can of drained uh, hatch green chilies, um, which was kind of the theme for this burger. I wanted like a green chili burger. Uh, also added Harvest Nature's waterfowl spice blend, which goes perfect with this mm-hmm. and perfect with any waterfowl. So that's available on our website. Um, brioche burger buns, uh, American white cheese slices. I wanted that nice melty cheese. And then I made a salsa out of uh, roasted tomatillos, more green chilies, the hatched green chilies, cilantro, onion, lime, and agave nectar. And basically just mix the 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 grind mixture into meatballs and then press them on. They had a big kind of black top uh, or black stone, whatever they're called, um, kind of flat top cooker. And I just made all those meatballs, smashed them into the burgers, and cooked them down then topped them with the cheese and the salsa and they were they really did did the trick in in, uh in for our our hungry guests coming out of the cold so yeah they're pretty delicious i think um oh god they're so good those burgers are so good um like i i dream about them (laughs) it's probably my second favorite thing you've ever made oh (laughs) um all right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about, like, we've hit it here. We, we did meatballs, we did meatloaf, we did burgers. So I'm going to do kind of a go-to recipe for, like, loose ground uh, meat it, just to do in a pan. Um, and this is what I labeled as the best venison taco meat. Uh, you can really use it with any game meat out there. Uh, and is a good substitute. It's really just kind of the process of making it and then the ingredients sort of in it. Um, but you could use it for tacos. You could use it for burritos. Uh, even in the article, I talk about uh, using it uh, atop French fries with enchilada sauce, uh, ground venison sushi rolls, inside an elk crunch wrap, supreme, um, roll tacos, anything like so much stuff. You could do it, uh, served to top rice. Um, it's just a great all around quick, easy skillet, one, one skillet wonder, uh, ground meat dish. And it's, um, so really do it. Dice up a bell pepper, dice up half an onion, uh, mince a couple garlic cloves. You're going to use about a pound of, of any type of game meat. Um, one tablespoon of harvesting nature's big game blend, uh, very highly recommended. You can get it on our website as well, uh, right after you order the waterfowl blend. <laughs> um, and then uh, chili powder, smoked paprika, cumin, salt, uh, rotel. I put in here. You could sub that out for a salsa if you've got a favorite salsa you like as well. Um, four ounce can of tomato sauce and a tablespoon of Worcestershire sheer or washer sister or whatever it's called. <laughs> I don't know how do you, how do you say it in Canada. 
I say Worcestershire. Worcestershire. <laughs> Worcestershire. Worcester. 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 Um, yeah. So you can use that. I, you know, what I think is very cool about that sauce, and a lot of people don't know it, and maybe scratching their head as to why I include it. One of the ingredients in uh, Worcestershire sauce is tamarind. Um, which I think is super cool, and it ties in because tamarind is very prevalent as an ingredient through a lot of Latin America um, to help flavor dishes and, and be used. So uh, super simple. Combine all those ingredients together, cook it in the pan. That's it. Like, easy, yeah, easy. you can't you can't get you can't get much uh, better than that. Uh, I would save like the Rotel, the tomato sauce, and the Worcestershire sauce till the end, um, but. You mix all the other stuff up, and yeah, that's great for like camp nachos, camp whatever. Uh, you could even use that as a chili base and kind of build off of it there. Add beans in, and you know other stuff like that. So, um, mm-hmm. I would say probably top top easy tasty recipe. You want to talk about a Moroccan style late trout burger? I'll do a really really quick one here. So this is another burger I made. Um, it's a I made it with lake trout. So you can do fish, and the, and the reason I want to talk about it is because I hand minced it instead of put it through the grinder. And the trick with making a fish burger, uh, which will be different than any other burger, is to have different textures that will help bind it. So I chopped the lake trout fillets with my with a chef's knife into about like quarter inch tiny cubes. Put two thirds of that chopped trout into a bowl, and then left the other third on the cutting board, and then I just kept chopping and chopping and chopping and chopping until it's smaller and smaller and then use a flat of the blade to kind of scrape it across so if anyone you know cuts garlic like this to to um smash it you just keep scraping your blade across and over and over until you just have an absolute paste that is when you add that into the bowl and uh and i think i added I added some like um, preserved lemon peel and some harissa and stuff to flavor it. But I, with the combination of that um, kind of large mints and the smeared kind of um, like uh, paste, the, the burger will actually bind to itself much better. And it'll still be a little loose, but without a bunch of different uh, like emulsifiers and binders, you can actually make fish... Um, stick together into a burger so if you're using salmon or trout or whatever even stuff like pike um but you just want to like have those different textures and it creates a lovely burger that's uh better than any salmon burger you get from the store or whatever so yeah um there's there's lots of different ways of grinding that's definitely one of them and the best for fish and it's a lot easier to hand chop fish than it is venison so it'll go much quicker Nice. No, that's that's a good tip. It's a good way to close out sort of all the methods we kind of talked about mm-hmm. uh, in the initial part. So, no, uh, I think overall, uh, we'll kick it off for last thoughts. You got, you got any, Adam? Try try some different burgers out. See what you like with your fat content. Uh, try mixing different fats. Don't don't just always stick to one thing. There's people who just get their get in sconce and doing the same thing every time and they get really stick become sticklers about it but but different types of grind can suit different needs better or worse or or different tastes and you'll never find out what's best for you unless you try them all so so yeah explore and and be adventurous with it i think uh my like last thoughts are going to be first off buy buy a grinder by meat grinder, it's going to make your life easier, especially if you want to get into processing your own game meat more consistently. Um, I like echo what Adam said. Try different types of burgers. Also, too, the world of meatballs. Like, you can do anything Ooh. with a meatball. You, you could have, like, 15 different go-to sauces, like, three different things you put inside of it. You can serve it atop potatoes, atop rice, atop noodles, atop whatever. Like, meatballs meatballs don't get the credit they're deserved they're like the versatile like go-to dish you can put them in soups you can put them in sauces you can wrap dough around them and you know i don't know make little puff pastry dough balls um i just made a, a cold meatball and rice salad the other day yeah like that sounds like little great. marble meatballs and yeah it was great um <laughs> i'd also say to you you know just uh practice perfecting the art of cooking ground meat um and I'd say you'll probably you'll probably find it much more enjoyable than you know whatever you're doing now 
So um, <laughs> thanks, everybody, for listening. We'll include all the links in the show notes and all that stuff. Uh, be sure to head over to social media. Make sure you're following Harvesting Nature and you're following uh, the Intrepid Eater on uh, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, all those places. And then uh, whatever podcast platform you're listening to, punch that five-star button. Leave us a review. Tell us we're doing right or, you know, tell us we're doing wrong. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night.